Good afternoon, and thank you for that, that, Zach, for that wonderful introduction. My mother is sending Zach a check <laughs> for these things. I would like to hire Zach. We'll talk about why. Uh, but so, uh, to, to reiterate, my name is Phyllis Schneck. I'm the Deputy Undersecretary for Cybersecurity and Communications from the National Protection and Programs Directorate, Department of Homeland Security. I go by Phyllis. Um, I also want to call out uh, some great people today from our directorate. I'm going to embarrass them for a moment, but our uh, counsel for National Protection Programs Directorate, Dan Sutherland. Uh, our Deputy General Counsel, Kieran Raj. Uh, and the great poet, Anthony Black. I'm going to embarrass you too. I've known Anthony for a few years now. And Anthony is the lawyer for the state information system. I may have messed that up, that title, just a little bit. Uh, but all of these folks have been instrumental in cybersecurity and bringing together public and private sectors. As Zach mentioned, uh, the threat has grown bigger. But let me put that in perspective from a Homeland Security perspective. So Secretary Johnson always tells us that Homeland Security, uh, cybersecurity is a big part of Homeland Security. And for us, in the 2,000 fine scientists, and these are the best in the planet that I get to lead and work with every day, uh, for us, that means making technology safe and fun and ensuring that our businesses have a chance to grow, that our markets grow, and that we take on their adversary and reverse course and eat their lunch instead. Right now, this adversary, they have no lawyers, no way of life to protect. They've got plenty of money, and they execute, as I always say, with a ridiculous amount of agility because they don't have to stop and say, what do I do to make sure I get that right? How do I protect private information? How do I make sure that's safe? They simply steal because we've innovated so quickly as a country and as a world. We have allowed machines that, I was saying earlier, are not smart, they're just fast. That's what computers do. They outthink us at the speed of light. They run through every possible combination and they find it faster, but they're not smart and they're only as good as what we teach them. And so we have to take a step back and look at, when we say Internet of Things, if you can't eat it, it has a computer in it. So as we think about things today from your thermostat that can tell you if you're home or not by how much heat or AC you've used, um, to your, your car where if an adversary gets the computer code in your car, they can lock it up until you pay them. So as we look at all these systems, how do we take that back? And so I was going to talk a little bit about the role that we play at the department, Homeland Security, a little bit about how we really need to work together. The private sector is the key to this. Private sector, academia, public policy, getting this right together, the unique pieces of this puzzle that everyone brings to it. And I'm going to try to keep that to about 20 minutes so I can take some questions if that would be okay if you'd like, because that's the only time I know I'm telling you anything you want to hear is when I'm answering an actual question. Um, I do want to thank the state of Arkansas for the monumental things that you bring, the big companies that are here, the different resources, the different ways you have at looking things, um, that you've taken back our former Assistant Secretary Greg Schaefer back into your home. Uh, when I was first getting engaged in some of the private sector partnership with government early in my time, both down at McAfee and right out of Georgia Tech, um, I was exposed to the good work of the Department of Homeland Security, and Greg is one of the first folks that I met there, working with him when I was on the private sector side. So it was a surprise and an honor to get to see you tonight as well. Um, students, academia are a big part of this. I want and plan to hire Zach. So on my way out, please talk to me. <laughs> talk a little bit about that. In the Department of Homeland Security, we have a quarter of a million people. We are the Coast Guard. We are FEMA. We are a, a science and technology research part. We are a public policy part, Customs and Border Patrol, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, Homeland Security Investigations, which is law enforcement, and the Secret Service is also law enforcement. All of those have a cyber component. And where we are in the National Protection and Programs Directorate, perhaps better named Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Protection, I guarantee you we're working on that. We have the operational piece of cybersecurity. We go out when somebody uh, discovers an adversary or an intrusion or something weird is happening on the network. It's our teams that go out. They call it cleanup on aisle nine. Uh, but it's our teams that go out and keep that entity running while we try to fix it. We are the firemen, if you will. We help them 24-7, whether or not you've had an intrusion. We go out, we talk to companies, we talk to government agencies. We say, these are the things that can make your network more resilient to that which would like to eat your lunch from the other side of the planet. 
Our mission is the response and mitigation to cyber threat across all the federal civilian government, so that's everything except Department of Defense, and all the private sector. That's companies large and small, academia, state, local, county, municipal. So our purview is enormous. Our team's not big enough. Again, I'd like to hire Zach. Um, looking at a lot of workforce issues, right? How do we continue to bring on the best and the brightest? Congress has given us the ability to hire cyber folks, top talent, directly. We've had job fairs. We bring them on with temporary job offers on site. Um, our department has worked hard to get that hiring process as quick as we can do it. Uh, we also have the authorization to pay cyber people a bit more, probably not as much as the private sector, but I guarantee you, Zach, that the mission and the impact that you'll have a chance to make are incredible. The things that you'll see, the skills that you sharpen, um, you can ask Greg about some of this, um, are things that you'll take with you. And we're looking to work with all of you. I would encourage all of you to come look at how to spend some time in government. How do you do some time in government and some time in private sector to bring those skills back and forth? The future of cybersecurity, if you look at the threat picture right now, it's unfortunate, but I would have said the same thing 15 years ago. Technology and innovation are outpacing security. So the things that we're building, we're not securing them before we build them. We're looking back and we're saying, wow, uh, that got owned. So what we have to do now is what we're looking at, working with the manufacturers, working with our policymakers, working with you. Cybersecurity and Homeland Security are local. How do you want to be looking at the next set of products, the next set of technologies? What does your incident response look like? How is your company, whether it's large or small, not only playing a role in the ecosystem, but protected? I guarantee you, every network has a visitor. Guaranteed. The question is, is it going to hurt you? And I look at this going forward. People said, uh, when we laid out the vision, when I came in three years ago, I said, this network has to heal itself. This network has to protect itself. We cannot keep coming running at it with Band-Aids. So if you compare it biologically, we've all been for the past 20 to 30 years in a system of vaccines. I can stop the attack I already know. And now with the speed of machines, we can stop that attack all over the world once we already know it, which is huge progress. But now we want to get to, can I stop the attack I don't know? Can I teach a computer not to run an instruction simply because it looks like it's bad? Just like your body biologically senses viruses and bacteria, and it goes after them and it kills them. So we're using information to do what nature does in your body to build that ecosystem, or what I call the cyber immune system. And a lot of that has to do with, it comes down to people. This is a people problem. This is not a computer problem. We built the computers. We built this problem. We left them wide open. I asked one of the inventors of the internet, um, many about 12 months ago now, about a year ago, I asked him, I said, okay, so we're in a room with no phones that no one can get in, no one can hear your answer, but I'll say it publicly. I said, did you think about how to put security into the internet when you sent those first couple of packets on ARPANET? And he said, oh yes, we thought about it, we just didn't need it. Now the reason is, at that time, no one ever imagined that computers would get so fast that they could absorb the amount of information that flows at the speed of light across the world right now. So the good news is, they are so fast and they're absorbing that amount of information. You can download House of Cards in just a moment. Uh, but if you start looking at that amount of data that flows, we've lost control over what instructions are executing and when. So the way to take that back is to bring information together and work with the markets, work with the private sector. So a lot of the, I think, differences that we've done in the past few years in the government on the cyber ops side um, are looking at how we buy more things from the private sector. You, the private sector, need to shape the market. We need to buy products, we need to let companies get rich and innovate, and bring those into government faster, use those as we're doing in certain programs to protect our federal agencies, put information together that those products make, and push it out as quickly as we can. We're working with the intelligence community to declassify as much as we can, to give that to you, and make sure that we can share that information. So the word information sharing, those words have been used probably too much over the past 20 years. To me, that means putting data together at the speed of machines and giving it to machines at one level so they can start to protect themselves and augmenting the way in which we can share it with people. So explaining it person to person, but this is a people problem. And I'll give you an example of partnership and how it's been misunderstood. I ran a partnership for the FBI many years ago called InfraGuard. Has anybody heard about that? You have, you have one here in Little Rock. 
And at the end, I was the national chair for eight years. And at the end of every year, I had to brief all of the FBI agents involved, so 56 uh, plus the resident offices. So it was about 84 FBI agents. And I had to brief them on the status of the program. And one year when we flew back, it was 2005, all the agents that were with us boarded the plane first. Can't make this stuff up. And the gate agent looked at the little yellow card they were each carrying because they had a weapon. And then she got to me after 50 or, some age, 50 or so agents. I didn't have a little yellow card. And she looked at me and she looked at the agent in front of me. He was a really good friend of mine. She looked at me again and she said, to him, will you be transporting this prisoner all the way to Atlanta? <laughs> I haven't lived it down, and many emails that he sends in an official capacity end with the word transport or prisoner, and nobody gets it but me. It's there for me. Uh, but the idea is that's how people looked at partnership. What would a civilian who was not dressed up uh, be doing traveling with 50 FBI agents unless she was their little prisoner? Uh, and we've changed that, I think, over the past several years. And we have to change that because the private sector sees a lot of data from all the products they're selling, from all the places they go. The government sees unique information by the very fact that we protect all the federal civilian government. We, with the help of our privacy and civil liberties experts, and this is a core competency of the Department of Homeland Security, collecting as much data as we need to tackle an adversary with working with privacy and civil liberties to make sure we don't collect anything we don't need. That's actually very, very hard and very, very important to us. But all that data gives us a very clear picture at times of what's happening in cyber. And we have the ability to put that together and combine it with what the private sector has and combine it with what the NSA will give us, declassified, which is a lot now, and push that out to you and help machines communicate that with machines, taking one baby step toward a self-healing network. If I fast forward a few years and I start looking at where technology is going to be, it will be even faster. We're at the point where machines have hit the point where we can't make them any faster unless we change what they're made out of or they'll melt. But you start looking at the amount of data that's flying around, where your information is. I tell people all the time, we now have the compute capacity to go through random bits of information and find trends on what people do, where they go, what they like to do. That can affect everything from insurance to ways of life to public policy. So you want to look at what data you're putting out there, what you're putting into social media, how you're protecting your own data. Uh, it does come back to this, but how you protect your actual passwords. Right. Good cyber hygiene all the way down. This is October Cybersecurity Month, so I have to mention Stop, Think, Connect. The think is the most important word in there. When you get these notes that say you've won $5,000, I know that nobody in here is going to click on that. But if it comes and it says it's from your CEO, and it says, I need you to go into the big account and move a quarter million dollars or more now, I need you to call the bank and get it moved. We have to do it to make the merger. Do you know that people are doing that? And in some cases, people click on the link even without the fancy, sophisticated email. They click on it anyway, and they're opening up their entire network to be connected to an adversary, a bad guy, that will sit there for months and be quiet and just look around and find your real username and password and go in as you and steal things or do worse. Um, on the threat picture as well. People ask me what keeps me up at night. I have two answers to that. One is I, I oversee 2,000 people in cyber operations that respond to everything from the electric grid in the Ukraine to uh, banks to federal agencies. So uh, I'm exhausted. Uh, but the other side is all of that and we don't sleep. So what would bother me most is when we see these threats of the physical infrastructure coming together with the cyber infrastructure. So the department has worked very hard to look at how cyber and the what they call infrastructure protection, your banks, your water, your electricity, your gas and oil, your emergency services, how those all depend on computers and communications, emergency communications as well, the ability if the phones go out, we have a special calling card for you. Uh, Ten years ago, that was dedicated copper line. It's fairly easy to give you. Now it's all internet. So if you think about how do I guarantee you a piece of the internet working with the service providers, this is hard. So looking at the cyber event that caused physical consequences, that's what bothers me. We don't care about protecting a machine for the machine. We care about what the machine does, what it stores, how it affects you, how it affects our way of life, and all of this is local. So all of these are things that at the local level you need to think about in your schools, in your policy, uh, where you shop, the information you give out, the devices in your home, medical devices, uh, this, this new notion was, it's not a new notion, but it's been newly prevalent of ransomware. 
where uh, the bad guy will come in and literally lock up your access to your information until you pay them electronically. Uh, we tell you, please don't do that, because if you pay them, you're just showing them you'll pay them. Often they may not even unlock it. But this is a whole new world, because beyond the information they may lock up, what if you went out one day to your car and you couldn't start it, because it's got a computer in it, until you paid some bad guy the ransom for it? So the ability to relinquish control to someone else electronically is what we're trying to fight. So we've made a lot of progress looking at how we get machines to use that speed of machines to bring information together, to use uh, the authorization that Congress just gave us in the Cybersecurity Act 2015, looking at how our operations center, one acronym today, the National Cybersecurity and Communications Integration Center, which comes uh, from the, the Schaefer administration, uh, but building it up, we call it the NKIC. This is your dark room with your big screens that really does look Hollywoodish, but it's not, it's hardcore. We've got about 50 people on the watch floor, 700 person operation across three states. This is the heart and soul of cybersecurity at, at, in ops and operations. And this is where we may detect an intrusion. It's where the FBI or the Secret Service or the NSA may report an intrusion to us and tell us about it. It's where our teams are based. We call them flyaway teams. We put them on an airplane, they go overnight, and they help uh, a company or an entity or even a federal agency uh, mitigate an attack. And this is tricky. You know, in the old days, anyone remember the Melissa virus or the I love you virus? People got on the news and they said, pull the plug. Never pull the plug. What happens when you pull the plug is, number one, we tell the adversary we know you're here. Number two, the entity's down and out of business for hours, if not weeks. And number three, we have no ability to watch what the adversary was gonna do. So we come in and we leave them plugged in and we watch. At the same time, we leave them online and we work hand in hand with our partners in law enforcement. If we're firemen, they're policemen. And they go after these guys and put them in orange jumpsuits. And you hear more and more, I was just hearing uh, John Carlin from DOJ on the radio on the way over here, you hear more and more about indictments of actual cyber criminals. So we really have the ability right now, if we can get it together, working with you and Arkansas is very proactive in this, working with people like Anthony Black and people in the Arkansas state system that I got to know many years ago, how you bring your cyber and physical studies together, how you protect that infrastructure, how you can take the studies that you're doing and look at what are the areas, whether it's technical or not, what are the areas where you can help shape how computer instructions are better directed how can we work with manufacturers to ensure that the products they make have to meet a certain standard of cybersecurity? Um, and how do we work together? Because this is what the adversary is doing so well. They work very, very well together. They don't have to sign agreements. For us to come onto your network to fix it, and this is a good thing, we have to sign an agreement with you. So unlike the movies, we do not come in and raid jackets and remove your servers. You have to invite us, and once we're there, we work with you. You control the entire investigation. It's the same for law enforcement. But how do we make sure that we can come together and work on that? How do we raise more awareness? When you pull out your new phone that you bought, on many of these phones, if you go through it and you come home with your brand new phone, it's got 100 apps on there just waiting for you, all blinky, they're all set to look at your private information. You have to go through each one of them and turn off the access to your contacts and your photos. So it's a whole new world where we don't know where the data is being collected and where it's going. These are areas where we need our best talent, our students, our professors, our faculty, our companies, our product makers, anyone that has a hand in state and local government or industry has a role in that. Uh, and, and to that account, I would like to hire a lot more top talent. And we're really looking at how we can take students and give them an opportunity for us to work with private sector to pay their college tuition and then they would come out and do a tour of duty in government and get some really sharp skills they wouldn't get anywhere else. And I've been on both sides. I can tell you that some things that we get to see and do are just amazing. And that's why sleep is overrated, truly. But then you come out and you bring those skills to the private sector. And you show the private sector different ways of doing things, but you also get an appreciation for business and the bottom line and a shareholder and, and how to really work with a customer. And then back and forth between government and private sector as they wish we're making that transition smoother. So that is one way that we see we're going to help uh, combat this adversary. Uh, another piece that I look at is, especially in our organization, how to promote top technical talent as well. So up to now, anyone watch The Big Bang Theory? Stereotypically, the nerds never get to rise up to management. I want nerd leaders. 
So what we've done is create uh, really good career paths where our top talent, even the ones that look at their feet when they interview, our top talent that really shows an interest in wanting, not if they don't, but if they want to lead a team, making them a career path. Because that's how your government's going to mature. That's how your companies are going to mature. We have to reward this. Uh, we're looking to build, and we have a, a fairly diverse workforce, but I'm looking to make it better. Every uh, group I meet, I brought in a group of high school girls called Girls Who Code. We took down this, this op center, a classified environment. We took it down to unclassified and brought them in there. Um, if anyone knows what it's like to try to get 30 high school girls to give up every cell phone electronic device they have for a few minutes, uh, you know, sure there's no more Fitbit, uh, but they got to see the inside of this. I want to show young women that you too can, can be in cybersecurity. You can do everything, you can have everything, but the diversity in the workforce is very important. Uh, not only the genders, but ethnicity, because the adversary is diverse, and if we don't fight that with different perspectives, we are going to lose. So we try very hard, we go to high schools, we go to colleges, everywhere we are. When I first got here, uh, we presented our vision to Secretary Johnson. He said, I want to go where they made you. I think he was kidding, but we actually went down to Georgia Tech, and we went to his alma mater at Morehouse, and we spoke to hundreds of students about coming to work into government, coming to work into cybersecurity. Um, so, Zach, uh, but really looking at how we can bring in the best of the best to work alongside cyber ops uh, on the legal side. We spoke to a lot of lawyers earlier that you'll hear about in a few minutes. The lawyers and the business leaders are the future of this. This is a boardroom issue. This is not an IT problem. There's an electronic cyber component to this, and you need the, the cyber skills. But cybersecurity has to get to the boardroom. This is risk. This is about where are your assets in the company. It's not about how much money did you spend on a firewall or web gateway or email. It's what do you have to protect. If it's data, encrypt it. But where could it be vulnerable? What are the holes? What's your response plan? How ready are you? Who do you know to call? You're already owned, I guarantee you. It's how are you resilient? How is your immune system going to work? And how do you run while you're under attack? Because technology is supposed to be fun. Technology is fun. We were talking earlier, Zach's dad works for NASA, my dad used to work for NASA. I grew up getting to see moon rocks and the shuttle going off. Technology is an amazing part of who we are as Americans, and it's our job to protect it and to lead the world in doing that. So I look to all of you for that insight. I look to all of you to come help us in this mission. Uh, I thank uh, Mark very much for all the work that you're doing, even though I just met you today. Uh, and I thank Arkansas for all the proactivity you've put into this, for the time you're spending here. I know this is not, this is not your day job to be here. I know you're going to go home and read a bunch of email, and I appreciate the fact that you're here. Uh, but this is very, very important. So if I can, I'd be happy to take any questions or. <coughs> Before we debrief on the tabletop exercise, we do have time for like one or two quick questions, and then Mark's going to present something. One question. Uh, just two things. Um, do you feel at this time that there is sufficient regulatory uh, authority uh, for what you're trying to get done? And secondly, I know a lot of times on the news that it's presented that uh, private you know, security companies come in to assist companies. Are you working with those private companies as well, the security ones, uh, in collaboration? Oh, thank you. Great question. Let me take the last one first. So absolutely, we need all hands on deck. Uh, a lot of these companies are absolutely phenomenal with what they do. The advantage to also having government on site is that we're seeing a lot of things they may not. So we can come in and advise you and also take that back out and boil it down to anonymous, what they call indicators, such as machine addresses that are troublesome, and push that information out to the rest of the cyber ecosystem, the rest of the machines that, that are on the internet, and protect them from what's happening. But we absolutely work with the private sector in this. And a lot of those are current and former colleagues. They bounce back and forth from government to that. And some of the brightest minds are in that business. So we, absolutely, we work alongside them in internet response and alongside our partners in law enforcement. And I think a great example is the Ukraine when a quarter of a million people lost their lights on Christmas. Uh, just to give you an example of how passionate our team is, that was Snowzilla in Washington, D.C., and we had to get them out, wheels up to Kiev a day early, and we had people leave and then fly their in-laws in to shovel the driveway for people with young families, but they went out anyway. 
uh, because this is who the Ukraine government trusted. The cyber emergency response team is within our operations center, and that CERT, as they call it, communicates with about 300 other CERTs internationally. This is not just a domestic problem, it's a global one. And our team is the one they trusted. They went out with some folks from Department of Energy and a couple from the private sector in partnership. And it turns out when they got there, the trust was so good that the Ukrainians showed us the actual adversary in the network. And the uh, intrusion was so bad that they all drove out in the snow in trucks and had to go back and turn off the cyber part and turn on the mechanical cranks to get the lights back on in the Ukraine. And it's not repaired yet. Um, so long answer to say we work hand in hand all the time with the private sector. Um, and also I want to, again, that's what keeps me up at night, those physical attacks. On the regulatory side, I did a lot of testimony in my private sector capacity on the Hill. And it was fun. And it was always, uh, hey, tell us what you're doing, what are you building? And I was told once you get to government, that won't be fun anymore. <laughs> Uh, it's different, but I have a ton of respect for our lawmakers. They've taken the time to learn cybersecurity. Their staffs have taken the time to learn this stuff that take uh, most people many, many years to ingest. And they've done that so they can do good oversight, good consideration of legislation on what we do to take us forward. And a good example is that Cybersecurity Act, which gives companies targeted liability protection for sharing. And this is not private information. It's literally computer speak. It's Klingon for the Star Trek fans out there. But it's bad machine addresses, files that we think are harmful, nothing that's personal. And this has been vetted by lawyers, partners, FBI, NSA, EIEIO. But it's putting that together to create a bigger picture. I call it the weather map. And that piece of legislation allows us to take disparate bits of information, crowdsource it, put together a better picture, and push it out at the speed of light. Literally, machines are sending it to other machines. It is the speed of light. Um, so I do think and appreciate a lot of their help on that. I think the future is going to be up to that partnership. Government and private sector need to figure out what should be regulated and what should not. But I have the utmost respect and gratitude for the work the Hill's done for us. One more. Mark. I think we've got to get her back to a flight. <laughs> this is an Arkansas travel certificate. And those of you that are from Arkansas, this is a huge deal, which means she's now an ambassador forever to the state of Arkansas, <laughs> which also means you can only say good things going forward. And so this has the governor and secretary of state signature. And Phyllis, thank you very much for coming to Arkansas. Thank you so much. Wow. Yeah. Wait, right. Go ahead. Thank you. Now they're going to debrief a little bit about yep. what they did today while I run Phyllis right. to the airport. Two of her colleagues are coming forward. I'm waiting for them both to come forward and they left my... Uh, Phyllis has to go out. Y'all have no idea. And Phyllis is one of the intellectual giants of cybersecurity in the entire globe. And the fact that she is... It, what was evident working with her today is how humble she is. She has an immense amount of humility. Now I'm going to let you go first. You, you want to introduce it? Yeah, Dan? Why don't you introduce okay. it? Right. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm um, Dan Sutherland. I get the privilege of being Phyllis's lawyer. Um, you can take that where you want to, I guess. Um, today, the reason why we're here is because um, Mark, Anthony, uh, Black, um, and our colleagues at Walmart's uh, legal department co-hosted with us a, a, a day-long exercise for primarily for lawyers trying to think about a data breach and what do we do in the course of a data breach. So we went through a, a day-long exercise of, of a, we, we had a, a theoretical uh, university that suffered a data breach and then we just kind of walked through day by, as yeah, the day went along, how each part of, of the um, uh, response should, should evolve. We had about half lawyers there, about half people from uh, the CIO um, kind of community. And I think uh, what we thought we would do is just give you a little bit of a debrief. What did we learn from our, our discussion today? We had about what, 35, 40 people right. um, in the room. So uh, I think between the, the three of us, we're going to give you some of the uh, high-level things that we, that we learned from it. So I'll turn it over to you. Right. 
Thanks. I'm Kieran Raj. I'm a Secretary Johnson cyber lawyer, so I deal with the Secretary a lot and other uh, senior leaders in the Department of Homeland Security. Um, I think that one of the main, I'll talk about maybe three lessons that we learned today. One of the main ones is uh, responding to a cyber incident is a team sport. Uh, it's not just an IT problem. You have to have your IT folks involved. You have to have your lawyers involved. Sometimes you have to have law enforcement or other government entities involved. Um, a lot of times you have to have your, your press folks because there's communications plans. There's notifications that might need to be done. And so you know, one of the interesting things that came out is every time we started talking about new scenarios, folks thought, all oh, right, we need to make sure this group is included or that group is included. And so it really is a team effort when, um, when things go bad or, or folks think that things go bad. So that's sort of point one. Point two is that in the cyber world, there's so many unintended consequences. Sometimes you don't actually know what's going on. You might think you know what's going on. You might try to address it. But it turns out you learn more and more as time goes on, as you learn more about perhaps what data was lost or how big your incident is and how much your system was penetrated. And so one of the other pieces is you have to keep an open mind. You can't just jump to conclusions right away. You can't see one thing and say, OK, we're done. You've got to go through the steps and make sure you do a thorough investigation and evaluation in any uh, cyber incident. And the third piece is, um, you know, one of the things that I took away from this is there's so many folks here who have done such great amount of thinking on this issue and are very sophisticated about these topics and these problems. And yet I think we all left feeling that there's still so much left to do. There's still so much left to learn and so many more, um, you know, plans that need to be thought about and, and, and how we would go about in various different scenarios because there isn't just one type of cyber incident. There's many different types of cyber incidents. And so it's important to do these exercises, continue to, uh, to learn more and to educate each other because frankly today I thought it was a, a two-way street. I think a lot of the government folks you know, were able to talk about some of our services, but we learned a lot from the private sector and the, the local government. So those are the three, three things that uh, I took away. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm Mark Myers. I'm the State Chief Technology Officer and the Director of the Department of Information Systems. I guess there were a couple pieces that uh, came away. Some of those things, if you're on the IT side, you assume other people sort of know, and it became evident there were some things that people didn't know. If we And uh, Phyllis alluded to it in getting rid of the Klingon speak. Sometimes we, we're bad about that on the IT side. We assume people can interpret things like what log files mean and uh, IPS and all those other kind of words, and so we kind of have to explain it in, in layman's terms. And I guess that was the, from the lawyer's perspective, we're sitting in a room, and those of you that are lawyers, I apologize on the front end, and they're like, yeah, we're left up to try and explain this in plain English for everybody else. And so the lawyers are explaining it in plain English from what we, they just heard. The second part was really from the liability side, and we didn't, you didn't talk about that very much, but um, from the, on the liability side, particularly on the private companies, you know, they're worried about is the federal government going to come in and start snooping around for other things? And that's clearly today we heard it from the FBI and Secret Service. That's not the intent. The intent is to resolve the problem that they have at hand. And so I think that was beneficial for the private sector. I know from the state perspective, it was nice to hear uh, about information sharing that, and the enablement of information sharing between the private sector, the state, and, and what you're doing at Homeland Security. And so I think we're going to, at least Arkansas is going to come away with a better understanding of how we're all going to work together going forward. So, Dan? Yeah. All right. I, I, um, I was the note taker, so I'm, I'm left with the, the last couple. I think one of the things that we really were impressed with is all the resources that are available. Uh, in a cybersecurity incident. So we'd had this hypothetical university in the, in the uh, Arkansas system that has uh, a cybersecurity incident, and then we started to think, what are different resources that are available? Um, we had uh, a couple of representatives from the FBI there, and they talked about resources that they have to come in and help a business or a, or a university in that kind of context. This is, these are local people, this is the FBI office here in Little Rock, who have relationships with people like Mark already, and, that, and they're trying to develop relationships with local businesses and, and others that they can uh, assist. Um, the Secret Service was there. Uh, again, the Secret Service here in Little Rock, and they talked about some of their electronic crimes task forces and other work that they do, again, to assist. Um, 
We talked about the resources that Department of Homeland Security um, has. Phyllis mentioned the NKIC, which is a national cyber operations center. It's an information hub for all of the government through which all cyber security information uh, flows. It comes into us and then it goes out to all the government agencies or uh, goes internationally. So it, it's an information exchange, an information hub, another, another resource. Um, one of the resources that um, Mark's uh, department uses a lot is their connection to other states all around the country through something called the Multi-State Information Sharing and Analysis Center. It's basically, you know, in Washington, uh, we love to have uh, associations. Um, every, every type of group has an association in Washington. This is an industry association, in this case for state and local governments, but also the banks have them and others, and they are a, a way that um, that certain industries that are like-minded can group together and share information about cybersecurity incidents and threats and ways to build their defenses, and that that, in, that in, uh, information sharing organization interacts very easily with those of us in government as well. So it's an, another resource that's available. Um, Let's see, what other kinds of resources did we talk about today? Oh, are there private sector? I think you asked the question about private sector companies. It's a great resource, and the FBI and the Secret Service talked about how they encourage companies that have a, uh, some sort of incident to bring in a private sector company. We talked about private law firms and the key role they can play in helping a company think through a lot of the issues. So I, I guess... Um, well, that's one of the messages that we left with is this is not a hopeless situation. There are a lot of resources available. We really have to get our heads around how to coordinate ourselves because there, there's a, a lot available. Um, okay, the last thing I'll, uh, lesson I'll uh, mention, and then we can take as many questions as, you, uh, as you'd like to um, throw at us, is um, just to build off of what Mark said is we talked about the value of cyber literacy that um, these are technical concepts, but they really need to just be explained in plain English because um, governors, presidents, cabinet secretaries, judges, uh, CEOs need to understand them and they need to be able to make decisions about them. So we all, we find, I know Karen and I find as lawyers working in this area, we are translators as much as lawyers. We take our relationships with the technologists and try to understand what they say and then translate that to policymakers. And that's a big function I think Mark plays as well, is, is just in that, in that area. And, and so we really need to work at those areas of being, becoming more, um, more literate. Um, we had the deans of both of the major law schools here in the state, both participated today, and they said they were thinking about curriculum changes that they need to make in law schools so that young lawyers are taught these concepts. Young lawyers are not taught these concepts. It's not part of our legal education, so we need to think, uh, think those things through. And Probably we need to go into the engineering schools and teach them some about law and policy too. So it's a it's a common um, a, a problem common to both um, disciplines. Um, one of the quotes that stood out to me from uh, the day was um, one of the uh, FBI agents said that in uh, a few years ago he had a cyber uh, a crime in, in a cyber environment that um, they had to try in front of a, a federal court judge um, here and the judge said. Um, that he felt so out of, um, out of place or, or out of his comfort zone in dealing with a cyber-related uh, um, crime. He, this is, I hope I got it right, but he said uh, to them that um, I'm like a blue tick hound looking at abstract art. That was, that was the quote. Anyway, that one stood out to me, so I copied that one down. But that's, it's not just that judge. And the neat thing about a judge is judge is really an intelligent human per I mean, uh, really at the top level of intelligence and sophistication in our country. And this is the way a judge felt about it. That's certainly the way all of us um, should feel about these issues, and we need to tackle those, uh, that in, in certain ways. So that was one of the big issues we talked about, cyber literacy, how to get us in this multidisciplinary way to be able to talk to one another about these issues and come up with good decisions about them. So I think that's a good overview of some of the uh, issues or lessons that we kind of learned uh, today. And I think we'd be glad to take any questions. Mark, you're, you're, you're. Uh, we'll figure out how to uh, I was wondering, uh, how were the participants of the exercise selected? 
<laughs> well, uh, you were, I'm the, uh, we just um, called Mark uh, at the state and asked him uh, who were some of the people who uh, would be most uh, interested in participating in this through the state government. Um, uh, we called our colleagues in, uh, uh, in Secret Service, FBI, uh, the state emergency management folks, and then the Walmart legal folks are people that we know from uh, other work, and they brought a couple, uh, couple of their folks as well. So there's about 35 or so people that, that participated. It was a good mix of different types of people from federal, state, and, um, and private sector. Do you want to add anything to that? No, no, no. Okay. Yes. Um, my question is, from a network and communications perspective, or would that be completely impossible? <laughs> Come on, you take that. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yeah. yeah, I don't think that's an operating assumption. I think the, the real the operating assumption is how can we provide various services, whether it's actually technology through the automated indicator sharing or other education to help people protect their own networks. But I don't think there's an operating assumption that we would, for example, shut off all internet communication between the United States and, and abroad, if that's what you're getting at. You know, is it technically feasible? Not what you go out and do it I mean, is that possible? Yeah, it's not something I've personally looked into, so I, I, I find that to be pretty difficult, but I, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs>